Hello. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Angie Smith. I'm the director of the Roger Mudd Center for Ethics. And I would like to welcome all of you to the final lecture in this year's Shakespeare 2016 series, commemorating the 400th anniversary of William Shakespeare's death in April of 1616. Uh, before I get started on my in introduction, we are live streaming here. And I would just ask if you have to get up that you try to go underneath <laughs> the videos in the back here. So this series, the Shakespeare series, has brought to campus a remarkable array of events, uh, from theatrical, musical, and dance performances, to special courses in English, history, and theater, to a Shakespeare film series, to talks by prominent speakers in the fields of theater, English, English medieval and Renaissance studies, and history. Uh, and I was just told today that uh, actually a special exhibit just opened in the library entitled Shakespeare's Bad Quarto and Other Artist Books Created at the Virginia Arts of the Book Center. So I encourage you to go over to the Leyburn uh, Library and look at that. And we also have a WNL Shakespeare Garden, uh, which is a garden of spring flowering bulbs that's now in full bloom that was planted by Professor Bill Hamilton and the students in the Department of Biology. So as you can see, we've done um, an amazing array of things uh, to celebrate Shakespeare's, uh, or not to celebrate his death, but to commemorate his death. <laughs> uh, also, please keep your eye out in the spring. We have some other events coming up, uh, in particular, a special exhibition entitled Shakespeare's England in the St Stanier Gallery, which will feature prints from the collection of the Folgers Shakespeare Library in Washington, DC. And we'll also have a campus-wide luncheon event on the Friday of Reunions Weekend on April 29th that will feature Eliz Elizabethan fair and entertainment. So keep your eye out for that. Uh, in the fall, the series uh, will also bring to campus Alita Chappelle, who has made a feature film entitled Romeo and Juliet in Harlem, featuring a complete cast of color. So she will come and screen the film and do a talk back and also meet with students who are interested in the film industry. Um, before I introduce today's distinguished speaker, um, please join me in just uh, thanking the organizers of this uh, series, Professor Hank Dobin, Holly Pickett, and Janelle Gertz. Now, one of the most wonderful things about this series uh, is how it has brought together scholars, writers, artists, and performers working in a wide variety of different genres and disciplines. Today's lecture provides us with another instance of this variety, as we have with us today one of the most prominent historians of political thought in the world today to talk with us on the topic of judicial rhetoric in the writings of Shakespeare. Professor Quentin Skinner is currently the Barber Beaumont Professor of the Humanities at Queen Mary University of London, and was previously the Regis Professor of History at the University of Cambridge. He is the author, editor, or co-editor of over 30 books and hundreds of articles on topics ranging from early Renaissance political painting uh, to uh, the political philosophy of Machiavelli and Thomas Hobbes to the nature of interpretation and philosophical uh, and historical explanation. Though he is perhaps most well known for his work in the history of political thought, he has also written extensively on the relations between rhetoric and philosophy and on the reception of classical rhetoric in the Renaissance. His most recent book, Forensic Shakespeare, examines Shakespeare's interest in the genre of argument known as judicial rhetoric, which he argues figures prominently in what he calls Shakespeare's forensic plays. As one uh, reviewer of this book noted, quote, Professor Skinner's book is itself an impressive rhetorical performance written with both force and clarity, end quote. The Mudd Center has been very fortunate to be able to host Professor Skinner for the entire week. Uh, some of you may have had an opportunity to hear his brilliant lecture on Monday as a part of the Mudd Center's Ethics of Citizenship series, in which he examined the concept or rather the concepts of freedom as they have come down to us through the Anglophone political tradition. So you will know that we are in for another treat today. The title of his talk today is Why Shylock Loses His Case, Judicial Rhetoric in the Merchant of Venice. Please join me in welcoming uh, Professor Skinner.
Well, Angie, thank you very much for these extremely generous words. Um, I'm enjoying my week enormously. I may be slightly flagging, so uh, it's jet lag. <laughs> Just think it's jet, it's jet lag. <laughs> Well, as has been said, and as you all know, we are almost exactly at the 400th anniversary of the death of William Shakespeare, which was on the 23rd of April, 1616, um, on his birthday, according to tradition. Um, so I'm particularly pleased to be invited to contribute to what's obviously been a remarkable series of events ongoing uh, in the university. And since I'm talking about the Merchant of Venice, uh, I was particularly struck to hear Professor Smith mentioned that there will be an exhibition of quartos because, of course, one of the most popular of the relatively early plays, finished in 1597, is the best guess for the completion of The Merchant of Venice. Uh, it is uh, a work that had an early folio. Um, uh, Thomas Hayes publishes it in 1600, in which, interestingly, it's classified as a history, although in the first folio it's classified, very strangely, of course, as a comedy. I'm going to focus on the trial scene, that is the trial of Shylock, which occupies the whole of Act 4 of The Merchant of Venice. Now, I think no one doubts that if you want to understand this scene, extremely painful scene that we're going to talk about this afternoon, you do need to know about the intellectual materials out of which it's constructed, because otherwise you've got no chance of understanding Shakespeare's choice of vocabulary or the structure of the speeches or indeed the narrative, the way the whole scene develops, and the interaction of the characters. And it's those intellectual materials that I want to try to focus on this afternoon. And my excuse for doing so is, I have to say this, although polemics are tiresome, is that critics have not perhaps been very good at seeing exactly what the intellectual materials are out of which the scene is constructed. And they are, as I've tried to say, and as Professor Smith has already said in her introduction, materials taken from the classical theory of forensic rhetoric. Now, you might think that that's an unlikely source, but if that's your reaction, then we're missing something crucial about the intellectual culture of Shakespeare's England, which is that the principles of classical rhetoric were studied in detail by anyone who had any schooling at all. Now, not everyone who goes to the Globe Theatre, where this is one of the early productions, Globe, of course, 1599 is the opening, um, would have had that training. But anyone who goes to what was called a grammar school, Elizabethan grammar school, would have had. So grammar school was six years of education, and in the first five years you learnt grammar, that's to say Latin grammar, you learnt the Latin language. Um, and then in what was called the sixth form, uh, what you studied was classical rhetoric. I mean, very strange to think of that now, but the sixth form was often called the rhetoric class. Now, why this emphasis on rhetoric? Well, um, education was for a small number of purposes, and especially university education was. There are only two universities in England at this time, Oxford and Cambridge, and 90% of those who were going to university in this decade were going to become clergy clergymen. And in the Protestant church, of course, what you have to have as a skill if you're a clergyman is public speaking because of sermons, sermons being so important. Others were going into parliament or into the law. But there are two other professions in which public speaking is absolutely at a premium. And so it was an eminently practical education because they thought that the key to all of this was in the classical sources, by which they meant the Roman sources, so you needed the Latin language. But after that, what this is, is a, um, a training in how to speak persuasively in public. So what would you have studied? I'm now going to take you through Shakespeare's last year at school. You would have studied three classical manuals. One was Quintilian's great summation of Roman rhetorical theory, but that's a large and complex book, and I don't think they studied it much. But what you certainly studied was an outline textbook called the Rhetorica Ad Herenium, the one surviving account of the whole of rhetoric at an elementary level in the Latin language. But what you most of all studied was Cicero, of course, the great orator from Roman antiquity, who wrote a book called De Inventione, that's to say on rhetorical invention. Invention meaning, uh, in the original meaning of that term in the English language, um, how to find out arguments, how to invent them. 
So it's Cicero's text that you really would have gone through line by line. And I myself think that it's chiefly that text that Shakespeare has in his mind as he's writing this play. Actually, I think he could well have had the book on his desk as he's writing. So closely is he following it in some sections of the play. And if you think that Ben Jonson was right to say that Shakespeare knew small Latin and less Greek, then that is really nonsense. That's just a, a disappointed rival. Very bad to have been a rival of Shakespeare. He was a pretty good playwright. Um, he knew Latin superbly well. And John Aubrey, in his biography of Shakespeare, says he knew it pretty well and kept it up in adult life. And it's clear that he can just read these texts without any difficulty. And it's principally the De Inventione that he's reading. Now... Classical rhetoric is mainly judicial rhetoric. And I think we could say, without undue simplification, that what you would have learnt at school was three main and connected claims about judicial speech. And my argument this afternoon is simply that you have to know those three claims in order to have a clue about what's going on in this pivotal scene in The Merchant of Venice. So I'm now going to have to spend a bit of time on those three claims. And this reveals um, the weakness of the kind of historian I am, which is that I'm always trying to contextualize text to show you what text you need to have in your head in order to understand other texts. What that means, to put it more pejoratively, is that there's a terrible amount of machinery for me to wheel onto the stage before anything gets even halfway interesting. And so in the first half of this lecture, it's wheeling the machinery on stage, I'm afraid, that you're going to get. Um, and that's what I'm going to use the slides to help me out with. So, three claims, and here is the first and the most basic one. Whenever one, someone has a case to put forward in court, this is Cicero speaking, and I've put the references to Cicero there. You can follow them out if you want. Or indeed, if you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint, just send me an email and I can send it to you if you want to follow any of this out. Um, but I'm also putting the references to the Rhetorica ad Herennium. But I think it's Cicero whom Shakespeare is reading, as we shall see. So the first thought is, whenever someone has a case to put forward in court, this is because there is a cause in controversy. I can't too much stress that phrase, a cause in controversy. That's to say there's a dispute between two opposing parties. Now, that being so, there's cons consequently going to be a question they love this idea of a questio. Shakespeare is always asking, well, what is the question? In fact, it's his most famous line. To be or not to be. That is the questio. That's deliberative rhetoric. He's trying to decide on a course of action. Here we're in judicial rhetoric. There's going to have to be a question in need of adjudication. You're in front of a judge. You're in a court. The plaintiff raises the questio. You have to give the response. That blank, by the way, is deliberate. My experience, if you use PowerPoint, is that if you leave it up there, no one listens to anything. They just read the PowerPoint over and over again. <laughs> so I'm going to get rid of it until we need the next one. OK, there's the first claim. So the second claim is more complicated. The question that needs to be adjudicated. What is the question? The question that needs to be adjudicated can take one of three forms in judicial rhetoric. And this gives rise to three types of plea. All of this, by the way, goes into common law. Uh, Anglo-American common law is actually taken from classical rhetoric in its vocabulary. Now, these three forms are called the constitutions of the cause. How is it constituted? The constitutions of the cause. And Shakespeare is extremely interested in all these forms. And as I go through, I'll try to illustrate that from different examples of what uh, Professor Smith kindly mentioned, I call the forensic plays. So, three types of constitution of a cause, and the first is called the conjectural one. Now here, the question, the question, the question is about whether some action or event took place. Did something happen? There could be a question about that. For example, consider the beginning of Hamlet. Um, the ghost appears and says he was murdered. But everyone in Denmark believes that he was stung by a serpent. The question is, was he murdered? And in a way, the play is all about that question. Hamlet's got to find out 
Was he murdered? And of course, he was telling the truth. Second question. There can be what's called the legal issue. That's extremely confusing because, of course, all of this is legal. Um, and, and the Latin is probably better. This is the negotialis, what has to be negotiated. And now here the question arises, as the Latin says, a scripto, that's to say, out of something inscribed, out of something written. And so the question is about the correct interpretation of a legal text. That can always raise big questions in court. So there's another question. How are we to understand a text? Now, that often happens in Shakespeare's plays as well. Uh, indeed, one of the longest speeches in the whole of the canon is the archbishop's speech um, at the beginning of Henry V, when the king asks the question of the archbishop, remember, is it lawful for me to invade France? And the archbishop gives <laughs> a very tedious response. He gives it takes up a tremendous amount of time, and it's usually cut in modern productions. Um, but the problem is that the English claim on France comes via the female line, but according to the ancient law of Pharamond, as the Archbishop tells us, no women can lawfully inherit in Salic lands, and France is said to be a Salic land. Now, the Archbishop has the text of the law in front of him, and he says, well, what the text says is um, that you can't have a claim in Salic land, through the female line, but France is not a Salic land. The Salic lands are in Germany. Furthermore, there is no additional French law that forbids female succession. This takes him a very long time, and then the king says, so it's all right, is it? And he says, yeah, you can go ahead. <laughs> so that's the legal cause. Now, the rhetoricians have a very important warning at this point about the legal cause, and this takes you into the most fundamental issue in legal hermeneutics, and it remains the fundamental legal hermeneutic issue, which is um, you've got to consider two questions before you go into court, or else you can really get into difficulties in court. And the first is this. What do you want to highlight? Do you want to focus exclusively on what Cicero calls the verba ipsa, the very words of the text? Or do you want also the, this, this, the mind of the writer to be considered, sometimes called the intentio scriptoris? Do you think that interpretation, underlying intentions and purposes also critically matter? Um, notice that the archbishop goes for the verba ipsa. He has the text and he says, look, it says Salic lands and France is not a Salic land. So he, he thinks that you go for the, for the wording of the text and what it does not say. So there's the one thing. You've got to be really careful about that. Here's the other thing you have to be really careful about. You have to be very careful about contrary laws. Your case may be good in law. You can still lose if it can be shown by your adversary that your case is in conflict with the requirements of another law which takes precedence over this one. Now, Cicero is very interested in this um, because you really need to know the law. I quote, this is the De Inventione, we're in 244-144. When one law permits or orders something to be done while another forbids it, this kind of contradiction can undermine your case because it may be open to your adversary to argue, I'm still translating Cicero, that the law supporting their side is concerned with matters of greater importance and is therefore the law that must be imposed by the judge. So your case may be good in law, but you're still going to lose. Uh, and notice how careful the archbishop was to point out that there was no contrary law. There could have been a contrary law in France, but he, he has to say, look, there's no contrary law. Okay, there's the second possibility, the legal issue. Here's the third, and this is called, again, the, trans, the, the terminology is very unfortunate because this is all juridical, but this is called the juridical issue. And this, of course, just refers you to the underlying morality of your legal case. The question is not whether a certain action has been performed. It's agreed what action has been performed, action at law, but was it performed recte, rightly? That's to say without wrong. And was it performed jure, according to U.S. justice? Was it justly performed? 
And notice here, uh, Ure, it's referring to the Roman law definition of justice, which is um, jus suum tribuere, giving to each that which it is just they should have. Now, number three is the most complicated. I'm sorry to say, we're not there yet. Are you still with me? Um, <laughs> this is the most complicated case. Um, because there are two possibilities here, and here's the first. Your juridical cause may be absoluta, meaning absolved. Absolved from what? Well, absolved from any fault. So that you're able to say, which of course is a wonderful thing to be able to say in a court of law, my plea is in accordance with law and right. And Cicero says, well, you are in luck if you can say that. <laughs> now this, of course, you may not manage it, but... If you think about it, this is exactly what Brutus claims in Act 3 of Julius Caesar, Caesar, when he claims that his decision to assassinate Caesar was, as he says, just and honourable. Sort of quoting Cicero. Because it was necessary to prevent the Roman people from falling into slavery. So assassination would accuse you, but this absolves you. So the cause is absoluta. And of course that's the claim that he puts to the plebs. The alternative, oh now, this is where Cicero really begins to worry on your behalf. The alternative is called assumptive. The Latin verb assumere simply means um, something has to be added. Um, and that's because your claim is not susceptible of a legal defense. You, you don't have a legal defense. Cicero says, well, you shouldn't be in court if you don't have a legal defense, but you may find yourself before a court without a legal defense. And in that case, you're just going to have to issue a confession. Now, that's a very serious thing to do in court because um, you're admitting your adversary's case and you're simply requesting to be pardoned. Now, the rhetoricians go on that this plea for pardon can take one of two forms. With luck, you can ask, uh, f you, you can claim that there is what you're calling a purgatio. That's to say, you admit the facts, but that you, d you deny that you acted intentionally and deliberately. So you admit the facts, but you deny responsibility. So, for example, that's extremely important in uh, Shakespeare's narrative poem, Lucrece. Um, Lucrece, when she's brought before, the, uh, before um, her husband and his... Um, his associates ag admits that she had sex with Tarquin, but she claims that she was raped. So that is a purgatio. And of course that's true. But here's the alternative, and this is where you're in real trouble. Um, you, you have to admit that you, you acted with foresight and deliberation, and you just plea f plead for mercy. Now, if you are in that position, you must, um, Cicero says, you must enter your plea straight away. Don't mess around. You've got to enter that plea straight away. That's the best you can do. Um, for example, that's what Isabella does in Act Two of Measure for Measure when she appears before Angelo to plead on behalf of her brother, Claudio. She's, uh, the, the accusation against Claudio is that he's had sex before marriage um, uh, with Juliet. And he, Juliet admits they have, and he admits they have, they're betrothed, but they're not married, so technically this is a fault in the law. And she comes before Angelo to say, look, all of that is admitted. It's all admitted, but you should pardon them. So that is a deprecatio. Now, as Cicero says, the problem is that's not a legal plea at all. Um, so what form can a deprecatio take? And I've put the answer there. And it's a strange looking answer to us, but they are very keen on this in classical rhetoric, which is you've got to appeal to what they call loci communes, common places. Loc uh, common places. Now, a common place is... Um, is a, is a judgment that everyone accepts. That's the force of calling it common. Everyone will agree with this. So what you've got to try to do is to produce, uh, in demanding mercy and admitting guilt, 
a series of propositions in the most eloquent form that you possibly can, which people already agree to, and try to show them that if they agree to that, then they should pardon your case. Now, this is so important in the law, in the period in which I'm talking, um, that a large literature emerges in Shakespeare's England that takes the form of compilations of these sayings. They're called commonplace books. And they're usually organized under the headings that you're going to need um, if you're going to have to plead for pardon. And so if you open these books, they, 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 they're usually in, in two halves. So good and evil, justice versus mercy, revenge versus forgiveness, and so on. And so you can look them up, and you're encouraged uh, in the law schools to look them up um, and insert them into your legal speeches, because that's going to persuade the jury. They think, oh, yes, I already agree to that. It's just a matter of applying it. And um, some of Shakespeare's plays are filled with these. Measure for Measure is, again, a very good example in Act Two. If you think of Isabella's meeting with Angelo, she has these four long speeches mounting eloquence, incredible eloquence, but they're all locki communes. And at the end, Angelo says, he's guilty. Why do you put these sayings upon me? He's just not convinced. OK, there it all is. But there's one other thing that I need finally to say. The last general claim that the rhetoricians are interested in is that whatever type of cause you may be involved in, any of the three types, there's a further thing which you've got to think about before you go into court, which is what is the moral standing of this particular cause that I am involved in? And here again, there are three possibilities. The moral standing of your cause is possibly, and here you would, of course, be again in luck, the honest cause. Now, an honest cause is one in which you claim straightforwardly to be telling the truth and standing up for what is right. You claim to be honest. And it's left for your judge to, to say whether he or she feels that this is an honest statement. So it's so important, for example, in Hamlet, when he goes back to Horatio and says, I've met this ghost, and he says he was murdered. But it is an honest ghost, is what he says. It is an honest ghost, i.e., he is telling the truth. The second possibility is that you have something called the causa turpis. Now, um, luckily for us, um, Elizabethan England has many Latin to English dictionaries because the, the boys and some of the girls are learning their Latin. You need a dictionary from Latin into English. And if you look up any of these dictionaries, the two most famous ones, uh, Cooper's Thesaurus or Thomas's Dictionary, um, turpis, you look up turpis, foul. Uh, terpis foul. And sometimes honestus is translated as fair. So in Macbeth, when they say fair is foul, wow, that's confusing the categories as much as you possibly could. I suppose the best example of a foul cause in court is when Othello is arraigned by Senator Brabantio the father of Desdemona in Act I of Othello, on the grounds, Brabantio alleges, that Othello has bewitched his daughter. Now, bewitchment, of course, is a capital crime in Elizabethan England, or Jacobean England, but we are by then. And so the very first thing the Duke says is, I mean, as often in Shakespeare, the, the judges are hopelessly partial. He says, who is responsible for this foul proceeding? And then they have to say, well, unfortunately, it's the general whom you rather badly need against the Turks. And he says, what? Oh, that's what makes that scene so terrible, is that um, it's a foul cause that the man they most need has to defend. OK, so there's the second possibility. And here's the third. The causa admirabilis. Uh, admirabilis, here are the dictionaries again, means strange. Contrary to the opinion of the most part, um, admirable is to be wondered at. And what's strange is that you're bringing this case to court. This is a strange case to bring to court. 
Now, Cicero says, and I'm quoting here, here you must move with particular care, because in this case, the minds of those who are about to hear you will initially be alienated from your side of the case. So, he's full of advice always, Cicero, as you know, begin by immediately offering an extremely strong reason in support of your cause so that the judge is not alienated. He'll think, this is odd. Um, this is a really odd case to come to court. Give a very strong reason why it's not odd. Okay. Well, there is all the machinery uh, rolled into place. And now, in the second half of the lecture, I want to return to the Merchant of Venice. I just want to offer you a reading of this famous scene, which occupies the whole act. Um, but it's one in which I hope everything I've said will... Um, well, it's meant to open up the scene. OK, before I begin, a word about my quotations. I'm an historian. Historians dread anachronism. And so I, I do not use a modernized version. I'm using the folio version in the Wells and Taylor edition. And that is through line numbered, because of course the folio isn't divided into um, acts and scenes. And so you'll see the through line numbering. But I've also put the modern reference for anyone who wants to follow uh, from the Cambridge edition. Now, let me just remind you where I started. Whenever someone has a judicial case to put forward, there'll always be a question to be answered, and that's because there's a cause in controversy between two adversaries. Now, during the trial scene, all parties reveal a very precise knowledge of this legal vocabulary. Remember, the scene opens with the Duke addressing Antonio the merchant. What, is Antonio here? Ready, so please your grace. I am sorry for thee. Thou art come to answer a stony adversary. Notice there's a question. It's got to be answered. He has an adversary. Now, the Duke of Venice has deputed the adjudication of Shylock's case to the learned Dr. Bellaria. But the learned Dr. Bellario writes a letter saying that he's ill and he is sending a young but very learned lawyer on his behalf, and that is Dr. Balthazar, which that, of course, is Portia in disguise. And he adds an assurance to the court. I have acquainted him with the cause in controversy, he's quoting Cicero, between the Jew and Antonio the merchant. And as soon as Portia enters, the Duke asks if this is so. And Portia replies, are you acquainted with the difference that holds this present quaestio in the court? Portia, I am thoroughly, I'm informed thoroughly of the causa. They're absolutely in the heart of the judicial rhetoric I'm talking about. Okay, so the next question is, what is the specific nature of Shylock's cause? Well, Shylock himself is very clear. He has agreed a penal bond with Antonio the merchant, the forfeit of which is a pound of flesh if the money he has lent is not repaid by a certain date. The date has passed, so Shylock takes himself simply to be claiming a legal right, something that is due to him. So he's claiming that his cause is juridical, that's to say there's something that's rightful and lawful here, and he's claiming that his cause is absolute, that's to say that what he's pleading for is simply his right. So here is the Duke beginning the interlocution with Shylock. How shalt thou hope for mercy, rendering none? Shylock, what judgment shall I dread? Doing no wrong. Secondly, Shylock also claims to be acting jure, that's to say, in accordance with law, and justly. And here is his great opening. I have possessed your grace of what I purpose, and by our holy Sabbath I have sworn to have the due and forfeit of my bond. And he reiterates the claim in the final request to the duke in the speech. This pound of flesh which I demand of him is dearly bought. Tis mine, and I will have it. If you deny me, fie upon your law. It's legal. Simply laying claim to what is his, tis mine, and I will have it. 
All right, the next general question, as you remember, is about the standing of this demand, the standing of the cause. Now, no one ever suggests that Shylock's cause is turpis, is, is inherently foul. And they can't because it's a legal demand. Uh, and when Portia makes her appearance in court, the very first thing she says is, the law cannot impugn you as you do proceed. So it's not a foul cause, but the Duke is completely unwilling to agree that it's an honest cause. On the contrary, um, he begins by excoriating Shylock for what he calls his unnatural cruelty and his malice and urges him to withdraw. So how should Shylock's cause be classified? Well, you remember there are only three possibilities. And here is Portia in her first words. Is your name Shylock? Shylock is my name. Of a strange nature is the suit you follow. It's a strange cause. It's not foul, but it's not honest. It is strange. OK, the Duke agrees with this, but his point is to say, and I think this is the right way to read his opening address to Shylock, is you can change your strange cause into an honest one. It's easy for you to do that, he says to Shylock. Well, let's reflect for a moment on what it would be for Shylock's cause to be easily classifiable as honest. And that requires us for a moment to go back to the dictionaries. Honest doesn't just mean good, notice, kind and gentle, well-mannered and courteous. And there is the Duke speaking to Shylock. He wants him to be touched with human gentleness and love. He wants him to show a duty of tender courtesy. If he does that, he will be honest and his cause will become an honest one. So now the question is, well, how does Shylock respond to the request that he present his cause in a way that makes it honest. Well, he not only vehemently refuses, but there's no other way around it, it seems to me, that he produces a satire on this idea of the causes. Um, I mean, first he refuses the idea of pursuing his cause with love and gentleness. He says, I bear a lodged hatred towards Antonio. But much more vehement is his refusal to act with courtesy. He wants tender courtesy. And notice, being honest as well-mannered, courteous. Now, Shylock knows that this is what is expected. You'll ask me why I rather choose to have a weight of carrion flesh than to receive 3,000 ducats. Well, indeed, they might well ask. But his reply is, there's no reason. There's no reason for that preference. And I'm not obliged to give a reason. It's mine. It's by right. I don't have to give any further reason. And he pushes that point home. Uh, it's a famous part of his speech uh, with some comparisons. Some men, there are love not a gaping pig. Some that are mad if they behold a cat. And others, when the bagpipes sing in the nose, cannot contain their urine. He's saying there's no reason for any of these things. And just as the same way, there's no particular reason for him to pursue his case. And so the Duke says, we want tender courtesy. And Shylock responds by talking about pigs, cats, bagpipes, and an irrepressible desire to urinate. Um, <laughs> he's showing absolute contempt for everything that Cicero tells you to do. He's showing contempt for the court. He knows the rules, but he's refusing them. And he can do that because he thinks his cause is absolute. OK, there's the preliminaries. And now Portia enters, and the trial gets underway. And here is Portia. Of a strange nature is the suit you follow, yet in such rule that the Venetian law cannot impugn you as you do proceed. You stand within his danger, do you not? Aye, so he says. Do you confess the bond? I do. Notice Portia admits that Shylock's cause is juridical. The only question is what the law prescribes. And she also admits that his cause is absolute. He's simply claiming a right. The law cannot impugn him. So the only plea she can enter on Antonio's behalf, if she knows her sister, which she clearly does, is a confessio. And she can't ask for a confessio in the form of a purgatio because she's just said to Antonio, do you confess the bond? 
And he says, yes, I do. That's to say, I consented to the bond. So no pagatio. She's just got to plead for forgiveness. She's just got to ask for mercy. Do you confess the bond? I do. Then must the Jew be merciful. That's all that can be said. And then Shylock. On what compulsion must I? Tell me that. Well, we know what Cicero advises at this point. He says, now, you're, there's only one thing you can do. Loki communes. And she moves straight into one of the most famous speeches Shakespeare ever wrote, Portia's plea for mercy. Now, this is very sudden. And a, a number of critics, even Professor Danson in his excellent monograph, characterizes uh, the oration which immediately follows from Portia, I quote, as a magnificent irrelevance. Wow. Th that's as bad as it gets. I mean, <laughs> this is what you have to do. This is what the whole of the point, you're, you're in the position in which that's the only thing you can do, and you must do it at once, Cicero says. Don't mess around. Do the best you can with the Loki communes. Now, these are in compilations, as I've said. This is a big Elizabethan um, genre of writing. And I have to say that what I don't think has been noticed by critics writing about this scene is that all that Portia does is to quote from a number of very well-known commonplace books. One is John Lark, The Book of Wisdom. He which shall have mercy of another, looking it up under mercy, what do you find? He shall find mercy for himself. Or Thomas Cogan, The Well of Wisdom. He that is merciful doth himself a benefit. Portia, it is twice blessed. It blesseth him that gives and him that takes. Here's another, Robert Hitchcock, The Quintessence of Wit. Clemency is a thing proper and particular to great and worthy minds. Or the most famous of all the commonplace books, Mirandula's Sententia, Mercy alone makes us equal to the gods. Portia, it is mightiest in the mightiest. It becomes the throne in monarch better than his crown. It is an attribute to God himself. And earthly powers doth then show like as gods when mercy seasons justice. Well, of course, it's turned into spectacular verse, but these are the Loki communes. Here's Kogan again. He that showeth no mercy, how dare he ask forgiveness of his sins? Or here's John Lark again. Our Lord Jesus saith, pardon others gladly, if thou wilt have pardon. And here is Portia. Though justice be thy plea, consider this that in the course of justice, none of us should see salvation. We do pray for mercy, and that same prayer doth teach us all to render the deeds of mercy. Well, Portia's speech, of course, is celebrated for its eloquence and rightly, but notice that in con I mean, she's done exactly what Cicero says. Go for the most... They all believe this. They're all in court. Everyone already knows this. They've all read these books. Just go for it. But notice these are all Christian and classical commonplaces. They make no impression on Shylock, and not surprisingly. It's one of the racial moments in the scene. Why should he pay attention to these commonplaces? And here is his reply. My deeds upon my head. I crave the law, the penalty and forfeit of my bond. So he rejects the plea for mercy. It doesn't, doesn't make sense to him. And why should it? Well, Portia accepts it, and she says, Chief thou follow, this strict court of Venice must needs give sentence against the merchant there. Bassanio then famously calls on her. He says, twist the law to our purposes, you must. She says, it must not be. There is no power in Venice can alter a degree establish it. Shylock, a Daniel come to judgment. Yea, a Daniel. So it's over. And there's the great dramatic tension. It was an absolute cause. It was only an assumptive plea. It could only be a plea for mercy. Portia produces all the Loki communes. They don't work. So that's it. I pray you let me look upon the bond <laughs> as Portia's very next words. And Portia is giving us notice here. Some critics, uh, very ingeniously, perhaps too ingeniously, remind us that the Latin word for a door is porta, a portal. Suddenly a new vista opens. I pray you, let me look upon the bond. 
now. What she's pointing out is that although it is, of course, a, a, ju a juridical constitution, it's about right, nevertheless, there is a text. It's founded on a text. And so we need to have an interpretation of the relevant legal document. Now, at first, it doesn't look as if this is going to make any difference. She looks at it, and what does she say? Why, this bond is forfeit. And lawfully by this the Jew may claim a pound of flesh to be by him cut off nearest the merchant's heart. Shylock, O oh noble judge, O oh excellent young man. However, by this stage, I mean, I took you through a crash course in rhetorical instruction, so you're all thinking, oh dear, this is not going well for Shylock. I mean, you already see that something is going very badly wrong for Shylock. It's dangerously premature, O oh noble judge. Shylock, and this I think is critical to the whole scene, seems oblivious of the fact that if the question now before the court is how should the bond be interpreted, how should the text be interpreted, he's got to move with great circumspection because remember Cicero told us, look, there are two things you really got to worry about if what's at issue is the interpretation of a text. And the first, you remember, was, are you going to take your stand exclusively on the verba ipsa, the very words? Are you going to just, like the archbishop, you're going to say, look, let's look at this text, just see exactly what it says? Or are you going to ask about underlying intentions and purposes? That's a very strange feature of the scene, that Portia goes, she prefers the latter form of interpretation. And in a way, I mean, Shylock is hearing that. Um, she always wants a balance. And when she initially concedes the lawfulness of the bond, it's in part, of course, because of the wording, but also because of this. The intent and, I mean, she's quoting Cicero again, the intent and purpose of the law hath full relation to the bond penalty that here appeareth due upon the bond. There is an underlying law, the intent and purpose of which is to make sure that bonds are rightfully upheld. And later, in a very strange little passage, you remember, she reaffirms this. Um, Have by some surgeon, Shylock, on your charge to stop the wounds, lest he too bleed to death. So she's conceding. It's not mentioned in the bond. But she's saying the words of the bond, that's not the only thing that you should take account of. It is not so expressed, but what of that? To a good you do so much for charity. Shylock, by contrast, always insists on the exact wording. I stay here on my bond. And when uh, Portia says, and I've quoted it, that this allows him to cut a pound of flesh nearest the merchant's heart, what he does, he relishes the exactitude of this. Aye, his breast, so says the bond, doth it not, noble judge, nearest the heart. And then he quotes Cicero, those are the verba ipsa. Those are the very words. And that's why he refuses the surgeon. I cannot find it, it is not in the bond. Okay, that's a disastrous mistake. He should not go for the words. Portia is now able to reiterate her verdict, and she presents it in two parts. First, she allows the pound of flesh. The court awards it, and the law doth give it. And you must cut this flesh from off his breast. The law allows it, and the court awards it. Notice how rhetorical it is. Court, law, law, court. Very emphatic. It's called Epanados. So Shylock turns at once to Antonio, come, prepare. Portia interrupts to deliver the second part of her verdict. Some of the best known lines in Shakespeare, tarry a little, there is something else. This bond doth give thee here no jot of blood. The words expressly are, the verba ipsa, a pound of flesh. So the disasters of having gone for the very words are revealed, as Cicero said, I quote him, 
Take care to insist on the underlying purpose of any legal arrangement, for then you can argue that something which seems inherently obvious does not need to be expressly stated. Now, if Shylock had gone that way, he could have claimed that it's obvious that if you're going to take a, a pound of flesh, there's going to be blood. So that doesn't have to be said. That's too obvious to need saying. That's what he should have said, Cicero would have advised. Now, as you know, the, o I mean, the overwhelming number of, of critics have taken that to be the turning point in the scene. Um, I quote Danson again. Shylock's bond now turns out to be unenforceable. The penalty is impossible to exact. And that could be duplicated elsewhere. Mahoud says that in his edition of the play, Brown in his edition, Keaton in his monograph on the legalities of the scene. But I want to end by saying that they don't seem to me to have understood the sources and hence the structure of the scene. To treat that moment about the pound of flesh as pivotal which I think people do, is to overlook the most essential point in Portia's case and shows that it, she really is a master or other mistress of the Ciceronian story. And to appreciate this further element, you have to remember what I was saying. There are two things that you have to be aware of when you've got a constitutio negotialis. One is, do you want intentions and purposes to be considered or just the verba ipsa? But the, uh, and of course, if um, Shylock had gone that way, that would have helped him, but it would not have helped him enough because there's a second issue, which is, is there a contrary law? Remember, Cicero says, you must ask yourself, is there going to be any law such that, although this bond may be completely lawful, I lose my case because there is a contrary law that is superior to it. Now, it's clear from the way that Shylock presents his case, and this is what Portia notices, is that he's not asked himself that question. And that is the fatality of the scene. And so here is the actual fulcrum of the scene. He can enforce it. Of course he can. Take then thy bond. Take thou thy pound of flesh. But in the cutting it, if thou dost shed one drop of Christian blood, Thy lands and goods are, by the laws of Venice, confiscate unto the state of Venice. Shylock is stunned. Is that the law? Portia, thyself shall see the act. Well, I'm finishing. This is how I understand the scene, and it takes us straight back to Cicero. As we saw, Cicero particularly admonishes you to make sure that your cause is not subject to being overturned by a contrary law, I quote, that deals with more important matters, since that is the law that will be upheld by the court. And it's Shylock's failure to heed this piece of advice that enables Portia to triumph over him. As she admits throughout the trial, the law in Venice extends to the protection of aliens like Shylock so that he has private rights. Of course, it's a commercial city. He must, aliens must have private rights uh, in commerce that are respected. But such rights are subject to public law and thus to the provisions of acts of the state that are designed to, pre to prevent citizens from coming to harm. Now, it is extraordinary that Shylock doesn't know that there is a contrary law that protects Christians in this way. He, he, doesn't, he seems not to know that. And that is the real fulcrum. He should know that, but he, he seems not to. But it's quite wrong to say that that leaves his bond impossible to execute. He can still insist on the bond, and Portia invites him to do so. Take, then, thou pound of flesh. But if he does so... He acts in contravention of the contrary law, and so he has to pay the penalty, which is the forfeiture of entire estate. And the reason why that's the turning point is that Portia has guessed, notice that's all she's done, but she has correctly guessed that when he learns the penalty, he will withdraw the case. It's not unenforceable, but he is going to have to decide whether to enforce it. And he decides not. Instead, he pleads for mercy. 
So there's the beautiful symmetry of the scene. Now Shylock pleads for mercy. Portia, who's just made the most famous plea for mercy in the English language, immediately refuses it. She's sort of forgotten <laughs> what she was saying because that, she was just, she's just a lawyer after all. She was just going through the best course that she can. Shall I not have barely my principal? Thou shalt have nothing but the forfeiture to be so taken at thy peril, Jew. Why then the devil give him good of it? I'll stay no longer question. The question to which Shylock here refers is the quaestio he brought before the court, which is, should he be allowed to enforce his penal bond? Notice, he's withdrawn the question, so there is nothing left for him to say. I'll stay no longer question. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay, I think we have about 15 minutes or so for questions. Uh, if anybody needs to leave at this point, but no, we're good. Okay, would you like me to call on people? Or yes, please. You? Okay, good. So, yes, David. To follow on your lecture on Monday. And oh, yes. Shylock is less with what Hobbes would call a free choice. Absolutely. Yes, I think that's a very important point. Um, because it's very commonly said by the critics that the consequence of her pointing out uh, flesh but no blood is that the bond is not enforceable. But the bond is enforceable, it's just that there's a, there's a forfeit for enforcing it. <laughs> now, he could decide to enforce it, but he loses his goods. Um, and that's Portia's bet. Um, so that's exactly right, yes. That's my reading of the scene. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't remember... I don't in front of me, but I, I, I think this actually. <laughs> okay. Um, because it's not just a forfeit of his, his, his life. He goes his on. His now, life stands in, so it's mm. so it's 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 forfeiture of his property and of his life. Yeah. What happened? If he were, yeah. for instance, a revenge protagonist in a revenge play, he just sink that knife right into Antonio. Right. I mean, what's interesting about the play is is what's legally possible. Yes. Is constrained by Shylock's yes. inhibition against acting outside the law. Yes. You know? Yes. Um, and so when I'll find you the passage because it, this yes. is very important point. Yeah. Um, if it be proved against an alien yeah. that by yes. direct or indirect attempts he seek the life of any citizen, the party against the which he doth contrive shall seize one half his goods, the other half come to the privy coffer of the state and the offender's life lies in the mercy of the Duke only, yeah. right? So he's basically, this, it's, a capital, it's virtually a capital crime. Yes, this is Portia after this passage. Yes. So the line that I'm presenting to you uh, suggests that yeah. I'm talking about the judicial rhetoric in the scene, and this is the end. I'll stay no longer question. Yes. Portia then not only contradicts what she said about mercy, she contradicts her statement of the contrary yes. law. Because he has accepted the statement of the contrary law, which he clearly doesn't know about. And the statement of the contrary law that Portia gives is to say um, that if you go ahead, um, <coughs> then your lands and goods are by the Lords of Venice confiscate. That's the contrary law. Now, after he says, all right, I do not prosecute the case, she then turns really nasty. Yeah. And she says, well, actually, <laughs> I haven't... There's yet another one. There's yet another one. Yes. But she's got him to withdraw the case. And then the Christians, who are hypocrites all the way through, um, she then says, well, actually, it's much worse than that. Because um, she now contradicts herself completely. And you've just quoted the passage. Because she says, well, actually, it's not just that your lands and goods are confiscated, but your life is confiscated as well. Uh, now, not if, because he shed blood, but just because he conspired. To he's an alien blood conspiring blood. against Christians. <laughs> And that's an extremely important asymmetry, because if he had been a Christian, then, of course, that would not apply, because all that's at issue is the shedding of Christian blood. Yeah. So what she's got to do is to get him to see that he must withdraw the case. And he withdraws the case, 
because he's lost the case, and then they really turn nasty. And she says, well, actually, um, down upon your knees, and the, the Duke says, all right, I pardon you to show that, that we are better than you are, uh, which they haven't at any point in the play. Um, <laughs> And then um, Antonio steps forward and says, well, I take half of the money, and it's got to go to Lorenzo and Jessica, and he's got to convert. So this is, this is appalling. I mean, they simply heap ignominy upon him. Um, and that is part of the horror of the scene, but it's beyond the legality of the scene. And, uh, but you're absolutely right to bring it out. But it is the moment when the hypocrisy of the Christians comes out most nastily. And after all, Portia, let's face it, comes before the court completely fraudulently. I mean, she is an imposter. She's in borrowed robes. She was not sent by Bellario. There's a forged letter. Uh, she is not a doctor of law. Uh, she's extraordinarily well informed about Cicero. Um, <laughs> but also, she does not reveal a number of things which would debar her from acting uh, in the case at all such that the fact that the bond is taken out in favour of her husband, or that she is currently sheltering Shylock's daughter. I mean, the hypocrisies of the scene are extraordinary and very shocking, which is why the, the, the whole play is so finely poised, and you can't play it as a, an anti-Shylock comedy. I mean, that would be to engage with the racism of the Christians. Um, so you're absolutely right to stress this point, but it falls beyond the legalities um, that were interesting me. It all comes later, and, it, and it, the, the, the scene falls to pieces dreadfully. Is there, is there not another step? You would talk earlier about the very words versus mm. their intention. Versus yes. Their meaning. And Portia has to go there, even though Shylock traps herself by focusing on the words of the bond, and she then talks about the blood. Doesn't she have to then understand the intention of the bond, which is malice, an intention yeah. to kill Antonio in order then to apply his yeah. second law. <coughs> yeah, very interesting. Yes. Um, sh once she's got to the state that we left her at, um, she leaves the legalities. But what she's very clever about, and it's, uh, as you know, it's licensed by the, by the Ciceronian account, is the reason you shouldn't just go for the words is that if you go for the intentions, of course, you haven't given up the words. If you insist on the words, you've given up the intentions. So she always goes for both. And when one helps her, she goes for that. And when the other helps her, she goes for that. So the intent and purpose of the law is what she first invokes. But then she goes, as he does, for the very words. If you go for the very words, well, it just says, it just says flesh. So he has boxed himself in. And I think, actually, he would be expected to box himself in um, because it would have been understood uh, in Shakespeare's England that this is what's to be expected of a Jew in court because Jewish hermeneutics... This would be quite clear at the time, I think, who art, in his, um, in his account of these matters in 1594, he says that there is a Jewish way of interpretation, which they're used to, of course, from, from um, interpretation of sacred text, which is you just go for the words. So she knows that Shylock's going to do that, and she knows that that's going to be fatal. Um, it appears that Shylock's major mistake was relying on, on the words, but could he uh, possibly have had another strategy even after uh, Portia appears to nail him on the law of you can't shed a Christian's blood if he had perhaps said that, well, I'm acting with the authority of the court, and so the authority of Venice, and uh, there's the death penalty in Venice when somebody does something so wrong that he's executed, and that's with the authority of the state, so the state is shedding a Christian's blood. So according to what Cicero is saying, where if, there, if there's a higher law, then it invalidates the law you're pressing. Could he have said that the higher law is invalidated because the state is a hypocrite? Yeah, very good. That's excellent. <laughs> <laughs> well, remember, the, the, the way in which it actually goes in the play um, is that Shylock could have avoided... I mean, this goes back to what's just been said. He could have avoided the first problem because if he'd, like um, Portia, allowed intentionality and the very words, he could have said, well, look, um, it's obvious. 
that this bond is still valid because you don't have to spell out all this stuff. It must be in the intentionality. You know, you can't have flesh without blood. Um, you could go that way. And he should have gone that way. But it's still not going to work. And it's still not going to work because of what we were talking about, which is that there's a contrary law. Now, Portia has two statements of this contrary law. Um, and she contradicts herself in the statement. And of course, the second one is going to be fatal anyway. But the first one is bad enough because that leaves Shylock in the position that you very nicely put him in, which is to say he has a choice, but it's not that he's got an unconditional um, bond. He's got a conditional bond because although it's still possible for him to take the pound of flesh, it's not legally possible. So he, if he takes it, he's got to pay a forfeit. But it turns out the forfeit is colossal. So even if he had followed you in a different hermeneutics, that would have carried him some distance, but he's still going to be blocked because there are two moments in Portia's, in Portia's success against him. And the first is he's gone the wrong way with his hermeneutics, so she catches him on his pound of flesh. That's all it is. Um, but then what I think is crucial is, I think we're agreed about, is the contrary law is that that's what he doesn't seem to know about, which seems to me amazing, but he doesn't know about it. And she's reckoning that, by the way. She's, she's guessing that he doesn't know about it because of the way he set out his, his case. Yeah. Yes, right when uh, Shylock disgraces the court uh, after they ask him, why do you want this bond? And he goes on with the, his various um, examples yes. of these random things. Um, could those be seen as anti-loki communes? Um, as sort of like a, a, re a repellent form of that same kind of rhetoric? Yeah, that's a really interesting point. Uh, I mean, I think one of the things which is very interesting about the scene, and you're pinpointing it, is that Sherlock knows about all these rules. Which anyone in the audience who'd been to school knew about these. That's the, the strange thing that we've got to remember. They're all going to know about this. And that's why they're going to start thinking when Sherlock says, oh, no one young man, I think, uh oh, this is not actually going so well. Um, but Shylock knows these rules, but he views them with contempt. Yes, I think that's right. And so he knows when the Duke is saying to him uh, in the, the opening speech that the Duke makes, he's saying, look, this is a strange cause. It's not a foul cause, but it is a strange cause. What you've got to do is make it all right. It could be made honest. Uh, and he knows how that's going to be. Uh, gentle courtesy. And of course, there's a very unpleasant pun going there because it ends after he asks for gentle courtesy. We all expect a gentle answer, Jew. We all expect a Gentile answer, Jew. So he's being asked to give a Gentile answer. And he won't. He knows that he's got the law on his side or belie falsely believes that he's got the law on his side. And so he continues with this satire, very reckless. But because he has this fundamental belief that in a commercial city, they cannot fail to enforce a bond. Because Venice is standing as the richest city in Europe entirely depends on commercial contracts. So that's the, po that's the way it's poised. But the Duke, I mean, it is a very racist play. The Duke is asking for a Gentile answer. And of course, the, that's why you must never modernize the spelling, because that's how it's spelt. <laughs> Interesting. <coughs> yes. Well, um, that is very interesting. The, the dictionaries are diction that because you're learning Latin and it's a difficult language, they're always Latin into English dictionaries. Um, so, but you could certainly look it up, carnis, um, source of our word carnivore, um, and see what it says. Uh, yeah, I hadn't thought of that. Um, it's online. We could do it later. We couldn't we? <laughs> Isn't that amazing thing? These Elizabethan dictionaries are all online. <laughs> yes, Nicole. Perhaps uh, I would like to ask you a question which I normally myself would regard as a completely improper and unfair question. It <laughs> goes beyond in the context of your marvelous lectures. But I'm fascinated by uh, seeing you analyze a major text here 
in terms of sister Alien, uh, judicial mm. and you uh, mentioned the connection to the Oxbridge education yes now uh, would I would I be justified in thinking that it is possible to see this educational tradition continue as far as the early 19th century so that some of the scientific texts mm. would say in including Darwin's origin of species, the fourth edition, this is history section, can be in part understood from and can be subjected to a similar analysis of what you've done here. Mm. Uh, you, 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 you yes, I certainly do. Well, I think that in the history of Anglophone education, I mean, including the education that would have been given in this university, in the 18th century, rhetoric was still what you learnt in your first year. That was the freshman course. It was the freshman course. Um, of, of course, the original foundation here is the, is the Scots people who come, as they came to, to several of the early universities in this country, this one included, and Princeton is another example. They were rhetoricians. They had been put through this training, and they brought the study of the Latin language and the study of rhetoric was what you got. Uh, you got more of it at university. You, you did it more in your first year, and then you went on to employ it. Um, but I, I have come to think that the rhetorical conception of what constitutes an argument is very unlike our understanding of what constitutes an argument, because it's a matter of, of rhetorical invention, that's to say, the finding out of what is suitable, because the issue is always persuasion. Um, and so the question is, what are the strategies for persuasion, as opposed to strategies for proof. And they think strategies for proof are not the right thing to be thinking of in this case, because this is forensic, so there are always going to be two sides to the case. So what you need is rhetoric to persuade. So invention is the finding out of the arguments that will persuade. Um, and there are rules for laying them out. Rules of narrative, of course. Very important that, that um, narrative is always part of this. So I think to answer your question in rather general terms, it would be possible that uh, quite a lot of our appraisals of arguments uh, up to and including the period that you're talking about, where rhetoric was the mode of instruction in universities, it's quite possible that our appraisal of those arguments are anachronistic and that we're not seeing how they are actually organized. Yes, I, actually, I think that's certain. Yeah. Um, thank you for unlocking so much of the vocabulary of the scene. Um, so many of these words are actually terms of art. They are, yes. And I was thinking about a line later that's um, in relation to Shylock's conversion, and um, the court asks him, are you content? Yes. And he says, I am content. I'm content. He seems, you know, far from content. Oh, I know. Yes. So is, is there a Ciceronian word content? Mm. Is part, still part of the legal proceedings when it comes to Yeah, very good. Conversion? Yes. Well, you, you want to I comment? Think he, mean, uh, he is indeed content in that he's right. He'd rather do that than be put to death. He's also contained. He's trapped. Things yes. have been so worked out around him that he can't get out of the court other than for a sentence of death, except by accepting conversion. That's how he's content, I think. One other quick point, in addition to the, the, the question about flesh. One of the things that I think is underlying the comments about flesh and blood is the biblical text, flesh and blood has not taught this to you. Yes, sure. The Spirit of God. The, yes. the audience would have been oh, absolutely. very, oh, would, would have been subconsciously thinking, can't separate flesh and blood, mm. not for technical legal reasons, but because they had, they heard that phrase in church a whole lot. Mm. Thank you both. Yes, very good. It, I've thought a lot about this. I mean, here it is. Um, Portia, I mean, it's very hard not to read this unpleasantly. Art thou contented, Jew? What dost thou say? I am content. Um, in the, the RSC production, when Laurence Olivier played Shylock, he screamed that word. Because the, the irony, of course he's not content. I mean, he's glad to be alive, but he's not happy. And of course, that is a very important point. That is his last word. He, he, that, he leaves immediately after that, and he doesn't appear in the play again. An extraordinary thing, because he's such a presence in 
our imaginary, is how little he actually appears. This is his great scene. But at that very moment that you quote, um, I pray you let me, give me leave to be from hence. I am not well. Send the deed after me and I will sign it. Do you get thee gone, but do it. Exit Shylock. And that's the end. So he can't be contented. Um, but I haven't probably thought enough about that. It's a very good point. But it's, it's not actually Ciceronian. No, no. A lot of the vocabulary is Ciceronian, isn't it? That's really what I'm standing here to say. I mean, that this is an enactment of a very particular way of thinking about how to appear in court. One final question, and then we'll thank our speaker. Mm -hmm. Under Cicero, once Shylock says, I withdraw, the question is the controversy that was before the court over, and what happens after that? Is that a separate controversy? Well, this is what we were talking about, yeah. exactly. Um, very good point. I mean, it's by no means the end of the scene, because the Christians have many um, horrors that they want to heap upon his head. But the reason I paused at that moment is that's when he, he's lost his case. And he acknowledges that the quaestio has been answered against him. I'll stay no longer question. There's no quaestio to be replied to now. Um, but then they, they've only just got going. Uh, Portia then completely contradicts herself and she says, well, actually, um, it, it's not what I said it was. Um, your life was, was forfeit and so were all your goods. And so then you get this terrible thing that develops. Well, I'm not, um, I'm not sure that it's the same law being restated. I think it's a different law. I mean, I think she sort of says that the law has got another hold on it. This it's is, true. This is about shedding Christian blood. The other thing is about conspiring. It's about being... To kill someone. So, yes. so that's... A, I, I think there's just... Two laws, and then she's just been told, been told yes. one. But yes. She want Shylock to just walk out, of, you know, get out of jail free, so to speak. And yes. Just go home. Tarry Jew, the law hath yet another hold on you. Yeah, yeah, so There's a further another, contrary law. Another. Yeah, yes. It is enacted in the laws of Venice if it be proved against Venice, and so on. Yeah. Yes. Um, so uh, she goes back to the law that she's already talked about, um, but that turns out to be. Not just the seizure of goods, which she repeats, but then... Um, but I think it's a different law. Well, it doesn't matter. The, yeah. It's a contrary law. Yeah. It's a contrary law. But he's already failed on the contrary law. Yeah. Uh, and so he's already withdrawn the quaestio. And she says, the law has yet another hold on you. Uh, it, is it part of the same contrary law as I'm reading it, in which case she misstates it? Or is it another contrary law as you're, as you're reading it? Because I think because it's about conspiracy and this is about yeah. bloodshed. Yeah but not necessarily death. Yes. Not that many people, even the most devoted members of the Inns of Court, would have known how many laws of Venice she was accurately quoting. Or Shakespeare may have looked something up or talked to someone who knew it. Yes. But so long as she's got him trapped both ways, he loses his property and his life. Yes. Who in the audience will care whether this is you know, Venice under Duke or say, oh, 1322 or Duke somebody else or something 149. Yeah. Uh, there, there would quite possibly be a couple of people in the audience who would care. Yes. Not enough to make a dramatic difference. Not no. No, I'm, I'm reading it, we're reading the, the scene slightly differently because I'm reading it to say that when he, I'm, I'm taking the Ciceronian story very literally. He says, I'll stay no longer quaestio. I mean, there's no quaestio anymore. I thought there was a quaestio, but there isn't. And so he says, right, and now I'm, I'm leaving. And they say, oh, no, you're not. So I read that as something new that's happening. Um, and so then she says it again. But of course, if we want to say this is another law, then we can do so. And then, of course, it is, as I was saying, the prologue to this really terrible section in which they take his whole life apart and they, they make him convert, which, of course, is, I mean, it's brilliantly brought out in the movie, in the 2004 movie. Of course, that means he's no longer a member of his own community. So th that's an absolutely dreadful thing they do to him. Um, whereas he thought when he was withdrawing the Christio that all he'd done was to um, save his goods. All right, please join me in thanking our speakers. <laughs>